I think it's worth taking a, a quick look at how we got to this point. Uh, after all, back in 1989, when uh, China opened up, I think most uh, observers thought that China would follow that same trajectory we had seen for many Asian countries, uh, that they would start out with uh, relatively low-tech uh, uh, industries, but would gradually work up the value chain, would develop very good companies, would in fact become international competitors to American, uh, American companies. Uh, so we, and there were some bumps along the way, of course, with uh, Japan, with Korea, with uh, with other countries, so it wasn't as if uh, as if this was not known and recognized as we as we dealt with China in, in those years. But what 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 were the differences? What why didn't China follow this comfortable uh, course? And why are we where we are today? I, I think the first factor is that the scale of China is just so huge. Um, it uh, it was hard to comprehend uh, how an economy that big. Uh, following basically the same path that other smaller economies had followed would would be different. I, I know that 10 years ago, every company executive that I talked with believed that his company simply had to be in the China market to grow. It was a requirement. And as we are learning now, this is probably more of a wish and an ambition than a necessity, but it nonetheless was, was uh, prevalent. And this belief I think um, softened strong opposition to Chinese requirements like local partners with majority partnership, transfer of intellectual property, and even toleration of outright IP theft under the policy of indigenous innovation. Uh, I think another factor um, 15 years ago was that the general idea was still that China, as it became more prosperous, would ease off some of its mercantilist pra practices. Some sectors would remain protected as they were in many countries, but many others would be open to foreign companies. Initial regulations to protect domestic companies would, uh, would ease in those sectors. Chinese companies would certainly develop that would be uh, advanced, fierce competitors, but there would be plenty of business to go around. And then finally, I think third assumption, I think, uh, was that the geopolitical, the security relations between China and the rest of the world would remain uh, relatively relatively calm and, and quiet. So as I tick through these three points, uh, I think they, they quickly bring up some of the differences between the Chinese development and the development that we saw from other Asian countries earlier. The size of the Chinese uh, market meant that uh, the American business community and the economic officials of the United States, uh, heeding their urgings, uh, gave tended to give China the benefit of the doubt for many, many years. And in addition, of course, there, there were and there still are many American companies doing profitable business in China, insurance companies, car companies, links in the supply chain of chemical companies, electronic companies, many others. Why change policies when there are a good number of uh, American companies who are doing just, just fine? Uh, but the, um, this expected favorable change that that was really, I think, built into American expectations of about Chinese policies concerning foreign business have not materialized. In fact, uh, some have gone the wrong direction. Uh, executives of companies I know who felt that they were things were going the right direction are now see seeing themselves being pressured in new ways uh, doing business in, in China. And most notably, China's sites have raised in the most advanced and important technologies of the future. And China has decided that it will use uh, all means of its, its disposal to favor Chinese national champions in these, in these uh, sectors. And these are sectors in which uh, the United States, other advanced Western companies have a traditional ad advantage. Uh, and so China having made this decision, it continues to use its domestic market policies for its own purposes to favor Chinese companies. Uh, it uh, continues to exploit things like uh, overseas education of its uh, scientists and executives, as well as IP theft by human and digital means as a means of technology uh, transfer. And uh, it, it uh, has, has uh, put a sharp competitive uh, edge, zero sum thinking in the economic realm, which previously uh, was, had, had much more of a win-win mentality in it, I would say, between the United States and, and China. And of course, the geopolitical uh, rela relationship has become very competitive very competitive and that bleeds over into into economic and business so i may have missed a few big factors here and i'd love to 
I'd love to hear them, but I think few would argue with this overall direction uh, of of uh, U.S.-China economic relations, which is which has generally gone in a different direction from America's expectations and hopes uh, of, of several years back. But most important, what can be done? I, I really think most of the heavy lifting has to be done by the uh, American government, but with the strong support of the business community. I know many of you on this call uh, work with or for companies that are doing business in China. I know that you developed approaches to take advantage of uh, the opportunities, minimize the risks of operations there. You make individual gain loss decisions, what technologies to bring into China, what Chinese partners to work with, what government regulatory bodies can be counted on, what parts of the Chinese legal system will give foreign companies a, a hearing, how individual Chinese employees can be trusted or, or watched if not trusted. So there will always be US companies that will operate in China and they will they will be making money there. That's why they'll they'll be there. But I think where the United States must raise its game is at the government level. And I, and I, would, I would point to four areas. Uh, I, I'd say the first one is, uh, is enforcement or the, uh, the negative side of it. Uh, based on the work done by the, in the Intellectual Property Commission that I co-chaired with John Huntsman a number of years ago, I believe we have to develop a system to punish Chinese companies, the companies that profit from IP theft through rapid administrative procedures. The effective punishments are denial of the US market for finance, for export, for any, any purposes. And the speed can be achieved by changing the burden of proof from the victim to the perpetrator so we don't have these two-year uh, two uh, lags. I think they have to be, these enforcement standards have to be consistent so that Chinese companies that do uh, follow the rules, do not steal intellectual property, are free to uh, operate in the United States, and, and uh, I think the National Committee has been been good in supporting many of these many of these uh, companies. Uh, second, um, industrial policy, and I'd, I'd say yes, the United States does need government policies that will support our companies when they're at an obvious short-term disadvantage from Chinese mercantilist practices. Uh, we don't want a command economy over the long term for all of the obvious reasons of stifling innovation and entrepreneurships. However, when China is subsidizing its companies in an important sector and the effects are to destroy American companies in the short term, then the US government needs a process to step in and it needs a process to step, step out. Lithium ion bat batteries, for example, are becoming a strategic commodity of the future. China's building most of the factories, cornering the market on most of the su supplies that go into these factories for the world battery market. And the United States needs a government led action to support a domestic lithium ion battery sector. 5G wireless communications are one of the most important critical infrastructures of the future. In addition to squeezing Chinese companies out of the US market, which is what the US government is spending most of its time doing and trying to do it in other markets, uh, in cooperation with allies, we need to support non-Chinese business consortia that can provide end-to-end -end 5G systems of high quality and at, and at a reasonable price. And we need to insist on, on uh, reciprocity there. Third, research and development, the third area. For a variety of reasons, American government and business investment in R&D has sunk to the lowest level in decades. Meanwhile, American companies are sitting on cash and buying back shares. The United States simply must raise its R&D spending. If we can't think of better ideas, we should impose a corporate surcharge and plow it right back into university and laboratory research with publicly available results. It must be the United States that comes up with the next generation of energy storage devices beyond lithium ion batteries. It must be the United States that comes up with 6G and 7G uh, technology, and we won't do it if at the current level of R&D spending. And then fourth and last, international cooperation. In, in dealing with China, the United States would be far more effective if it coordinated its priorities and its approaches with European allies, Japan, Korea, other like-minded countries. As a small example, all of us need to show up at the international standard setting bodies that the Chinese make a point of attending in large numbers. Uh, I was reminded of this just uh, two weeks ago when I received an email from a friend who was uh, the only American on an ITU, International Telecommunications uh, uh, Union, International Teleconference on Future 5G Standards. There were 10 Chinese on the call. We can't expect to have standards go our way unless we, we show up and, and make the right arguments. So those would be four things that I would uh, suggest, but I, I really welcome comments and questions from, uh, from others. And back to you, Steve.